right, everyone, welcome back to our third and final talk today. It's from uh, Fiona Buckland. So Fiona is a life and leadership coach, facilitator, and author, passionate about helping people develop deeper, wiser leadership of themselves. She's delighted to count word-leading business and cultural organizations among her clients, including the Wall Street Journal, Alexander McQueen, and Viacom. In addition to her coaching and facilitation practice, she leads workshops on authentic leadership, runs Guardian Masterclasses, and contributes to The Guardian, The Independent, and Psychologies Magazine. She is also a guest lecturer in coaching at the University of London, and her book, The Thoughtful Leader, is published in 2021. You can learn more about Fiona's work on her website, www.fionabucklincoaching.com. So Fiona, whenever you're ready, um, let's just get started. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, wherever you are. And I love this, like, I'll do this analog. Um, lovely to uh, have you all here. And thank you all very much. I don't know about wherever you are, but where I am, it's beautiful sunshine. So um, I hope it is with you too. I hope you've enjoyed um, a little bit of a break out in it as well. So I want to I want to do three things before we start. Whenever I start a workshop, we always start with what I call the three C's. So I'm going to offer that to you to create a container for today. So number one, the first C is kind of confidentiality. So I like to do this to set a container. This is not a therapy group, so radical self-disclosure is not part of the process. Um, and I would ask, ask you always to calibrate yourself. If zero is I'm okay with stuff, doesn't bother me, and 10 is I'm a bit worried about stuff actually, but I'm really concerned it's, it's hurting me, it's painful for me, then stick around a sort of five or six for today, right? This is a workshop, um, not a therapy session. Um, but that being the case, you might want to feel free to share some stuff um, in the chat box and to know that it's going to be kept confidential by the other people in the group, but you won't be identified. There is no, um, uh, there's no requirement for you to share, but it's really nice and it's a gift to other people as well. So I want to make sure there's some confidentiality there. Number two is compassion. If there is one thing that we all suffer from, it's that we're so hard on ourselves, usually much harder than we need to be. So have some compassion for yourself in this and compassion for other people as well. Why for yourself? Because we're just here to explore. You are coming here to explore this question of how to change your life. And that might bring up certain emotions for yourself or you might be beating yourself up about something. So give yourself a break, right? We're all in beginner's mind. We're all trying. We're all learning. Um, and that's what's really important about being here which leads me on to the final C after confidentiality, compassion, is courage. Um, this, is, this is a courageous thing to do. You have other choices. It's a beautiful day. Um, I'm also very well aware of the fact that, of course, there's a fourth C called COVID, and we're all in this extraordinary um, moment in our lives that perhaps gives us the opportunity to self-reflect, um, but also can be a bit frightening as well. And what I really want to honour you with is your courage in being here. You had other choices. There were lots of things you could do, but you've chosen to be here to think about your self-development, to open up a bit of space for yourself. And so I really want to credit you with that. Thank you very much indeed for being here. So why is the question of changing your life important? Well, I know that a lot of people are getting interested in this now because life is changing anyway. As the Buddhists say, Nothing is permanent. Things change anyway. Um, you might be cruising along thinking your life is fine then something like this hits and it kind of throws all the balls up in the air again, sometimes for good, but sometimes there are difficulties in that as well. And so some of the things that I know about changing your life, and I generally work with people to do that, is that there's a really key thing that we need to, um, we need to get on top of, which is understanding that that power is ours and ours alone. But also that if we continue to run on automatic, if we don't take time like you're doing today, then um, nothing will change. Life will change around you and you'll have to react to events. But how about getting yourself in the driving seat? How about getting your deeper, wiser, non-reactive self into the driving seat so that you can um, live the life that you want. And there are many reasons to do that. So that's what we're doing today. 
But I'm going to ask you a question first of all. One of the reasons that I like to ask this question is because sometimes people think changing your life is so difficult, it's so hard, I don't know how to do it. But the truth is, is you've probably already done it at least once. So I'd like you to think of this. When did you make a change in your life? What did you do to make that happen? And how did you feel? And I really recommend for this session that you, if you don't have already, that you have a pen and paper in front of you, because for very good reasons that I'm going to talk about, writing this stuff down really does help. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to write down some responses to this. When did you change, make a change in your life? What did you do to make that happen? And how did you feel? I'm going to give you a few more seconds just to finish that up. I know that this might feel very, very compressed, so I apologize for the limitations on time. Perhaps if you've done that, um, I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to pop into the chat box, how it feels to do that, that exercise. Does that answer that question? Consider that. Thank you, David. Very liberating. And a nice reminder. Proud, Michelle. Thank you. Reflective. Good to reflect. Confident. Feels like moving into a reflective mindset. Yeah. Empowered, Caroline. Thank you. Giuseppe, thank you. I was scared. I committed to it. Use my savings, but also excited. Limitless from Anna. Lovely. Purposeful and encouraging alive, peaceful, surprising. Thank you, Rebecca. I'd forgotten I'd already made such a big change. And that's, that's part of the reason where, why I like to remind people of this. You know, if you like, one of the things that we can do to help us is to be time travelers, to go back and to think of a time when we've made change in our life already and to realize that actually it's possible. One of the things that I remind my clients of, I have a self-selecting group of people you can imagine who come to me when they feel a bit stuck. Maybe that's one of the reasons that you're here. And we look at ourselves and we blame ourselves for being stuck, right? We feel, um, oh, I can put the word up, you know, uh, we can feel a bit guilty. We can feel a bit ashamed for being stuck. But I like to say that being stuck is actually means that you're living your life right in a way. I want you to think of your life as a wheel. And this work is, I'd recommend if you're interested in this, looking at Bill Plotkin's work, and I'll pop that into the chat box in a moment. But Bill Plotkin developed this wheel, and he calls it a kind of psycho-spiritual wheel of human development. And that very much aligns with um, developmental psychology as well. So at each stage of our life from childhood, early childhood to mid-childhood to adolescence, early adulthood, 
later adulthood into elderhood. At each of these places, there are important lessons for us to learn. There are important developmental stages for us to hit. And what often happens when we feel stuck is that we learn everything that we needed to learn from that particular stage of our life and we're ready to move on, but we don't really know how to. And it would have been one day, it would have been um, religious leaders or shamans who would have taken us over perhaps with rituals. You think of the sort of rituals of, of that lead um, young people from adolescence into adulthood. And it's quite difficult to to do that in today's society where we've lost that. So people might come to coaches and a lot of people come going, well, I'm stuck and there's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. It means that you're actually growing and ready to ready to move on to the next uh, stage of your life. And yet we need to remember that there's a lot of stuff that we've learned. There's a lot of things that we've overcome. And that gives us a sense of empowerment, as a lot of you have said, which is so important, so important, because again, we can beat ourselves up, right? So thank you for that. Oh, I've gone back. I mentioned at the beginning that being on automatic may not be useful at all times. There are ways that we live our lives um, where we're kind of in a rut. We could talk about, you know, being in a rut, but I want to think of that rut almost literally. Um, the brain is lazy, right? The brain has two speeds, basically, fast and slow. And if you're interested in learning more about this, and some of you might already know Daniel Kahneman's terrific work, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, there are things that it wants to learn, and it's very fast to learn, and it, 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 you know, and it uploads, if you like. But that's the slow part of the brain, studying something, reflecting, and then putting into the fast. The fast is, um, is automatic, right? If something's useful, you put it into the automatic part of your brain, and you don't think about it. Like you got up this morning, you did what you needed to do, you probably didn't think about it. Um, when you were a child, I always use this metaphor, um, at the age I was, we had the green cross code. You had to stop, you had to look, you had to listen, you had to look again, you, you had to step back from the curb, you had to not go, all these sort of things. To, you know, so it took you a bit of time and effort and thought, right, to cross the street when you were a child. Nowadays, what do we do? We're on our phones and we just glance and we just go. Because our brains are, has got enough experience in, hopefully, to notice um, when, when there's traffic around, all right? So we don't have to slow things down anymore. We can actually, you know, go quite um, mindlessly, if you like. And that tends to be how our brains like to work. But when we want to make change in our lives, we have to get out of automatic and start looking at our habits and our habits of thinking and believing and feeling and get out of them in order to start putting ourselves in the driving seat. And why is this important? There's a second reason why this is important when we think about changing our lives. It's that very often we're living our lives according to the scripts of others. Um, we went, the subjects that we chose at school, the um, jobs that we went into, um, there's an idea about what we should be doing. And as a coach, what I do when I'm working with a client is I've got like a, you know, a kind of butterfly net to catch all the shoulds. I should be doing this at my age. I should be earning this. I should be happier. I should be. And we catch those because those are those scripts coming up, you know, um, and we need to be really careful of that when we're thinking about how we want to change our lives because we can change them. But if we're still following the script of some, someone else or our culture, our society, our family, then we're much um, more likely to start setting goals for ourselves that are not truly authentic. And that is a serious problem. Why? Because you end up achieving that goal, perhaps, and by the time you get there, you feel empty. You just feel completely empty. Um, and there's a lovely little video on YouTube that I use a lot um, that I'd recommend to you. If you look up Alan Watts South Park, and he did this beautiful little video about the dance of life and realizing that the point of a piece of music is not the final chord. And the point of life is not the goal, the end that you get to. It's the journey. It's the dance that you do with the music all the way through. So that's the way to think about how to change your life. There are lots of things, lots of ways that I work with people to do that. But I'm going to use one today. This is what we're kind of aiming for in a way. When you want to create new habits, at the moment, your life is being run 
probably a bit like the picture on the right hand side, a kind of motorway or freeway. You know, the way in in terms of neuroscience, the way is is easily um, uh, smoothed through. There's that saying, isn't there? Neurons that fire together, wire together. And it's very, very true. Um, we, our habits mean that, if you like, we've got a default pattern running in our brains in terms of the neuroscience and in time, in terms of cognitively and emotionally, all of the time. A lot of that is automatic because, after all, we are animals with iPhones. You know, um, if someone makes a loud noise, I'm going to jump. You know, I'm an animal. I'm wired to do that. But a lot of the ways that we live our lives are on that automatic. The other way, the rocky road, is the way that hasn't really been smoothed through yet. And we need to keep um, running through that groove, if you like, to create new conscious, useful habits in order to change our lives. Um, and the, the neuroscience follows this through as well. So one of the things that I'm going to do with you today, it's just one of the exercises, one of the procedures that I do, is to have you thinking about um, what's going to be useful for you. What's going to be useful for you to set that GPS to make sure that wherever you set your, you know, your direction, that you can check in with yourselves at all times, that your choices are authentic to you. Why? Well, there are good reasons for this. You want to put yourself in the driving seat. You want to get your automatic habits out. You want to get those scripts out. You want to get your stress reactions out and to put your authentic self into the driving seat. But in order to do that, we need to become um, the archaeologists of our own life. We need to understand what it is that this question of authenticity is about, because when we are feeling more authentic, when we are motivated authentically, then we're much more likely to, to, to stick at what we do. So there's less self-sabotage. We will also know, we can discern, someone used the word discern, um, what direction is the right direction for us to go in. And trust me, it isn't about your, um, uh, your uh, interests and it's not about your CV and it's not about your skills. It's about your values. Mm -hmm. So before we go on, again, a couple of minutes, and this would be really great if people could drop this into the chat box. If you can live your life less automatically and more consciously, how will it change? And while you're doing that, I'm just going to put up those references. be more self-aware, better choices that have more space, turn up more fully in the world, self-directive. I do less but experience, but notice and experience more. Thank you. I would do more of what actually makes me happy and healthy. More positive impact on other people's lives. More time to develop myself. And it's really important. This is a question that I ask all of my clients, the reason for that is that you really need to know what's at stake here. You really need to ask the question, why is it important that my life change? How would I want it to change? Change for its own sake might be one thing, but guess what? Six months down the line, you'll be miserable again. So let's really get an idea of what it is. My actions better align with my values. Ha, ah, this is what we're going to be working on today. Thank you. So, how do we get to this sense of authenticity and discernment of what that is? Well, as I said, there are scripts that we can read. Um, and these would come from external, externally to us. And they might motivate us extrinsically. So the example that I always give when I think about extrinsic motivations of this, if you think of the financial crisis of, of 10, 12 years ago, God, doesn't time fly? A lot of people there were motivated by, well, they were motivated by their bonuses. And so one of the things that went on were that people were kind of fiddling the figures because they wanted to be 
motivated by their short-term gains. That, and that was extrinsic to them, right? The money aspect was extrinsic to them. And so they forgot the big picture and the economy nearly crashed. Um, and it's really important to notice when you're motivated by something extrinsically, maybe it's somebody's approval or validation, maybe it's, uh, it's money. There's nothing wrong with any of this, but you need to notice if it's something that you're looking for from outside rather than from in. Maybe it's fear as well. Fear of redundancy can also uh, motivate us extrinsically. And there are good reasons why this isn't the best way to be motivated, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. So the way to be motivated really is intrinsically, with intrinsic values. Um, what is a value? Well, a value isn't an interest. Um, so I'm, you know, I like walking. Let's say I go on a date, right? Um, you know, when you go on those dating sites and they sort of have like list interests, so you have walking, yoga, you know, um, mild assassination, whatever it might be, you know. Um, uh, but let's say I go on a date with someone who says, I like walking and off we go. But I like walking because it connects me with my values of wonder and growth and love and appreciation. I love to stop and look at some beautiful, exquisite thing that's just happening, perhaps something that's starting to grow. But what if my date also loves walking, but actually likes the challenge of getting up a hill really, really quickly and let's go, let's go. And they arrive in Lycra and they're very pushy and not really that interested in what I'm interested in. Well, is that going to be a match? No. So the interests are not really the things that are motivating us or indeed the things that actually take us to what our values are. There's, there's something beneath that that's really important. Now, why would it be, um, why would this matter if it's extrinsic or intrinsic? Well, there's quite a lot of evidence now that shows that people who are motivated intrinsically when they hit problems, they are more creative, they're more resilient, um, they uh, come up with better solutions, um, they will work harder for longer, they'll put more effort in, and they'll think about the long-term picture as well. Whereas people who are motivated extrinsically tend to do only as much as they need to do to get what they want. And then that's it. Now, that's not bad. I'm not going to make it wrong. But you can see when you're thinking about changing your life, how this, um, how this might be quite tricky, right? How it might... Um, that might cause problems in leaving you feeling empty or indeed self-sabotaging yourself as well. So this is a list of the kind of values that we're talking about. Now, you can go on the web, and I'm sure a lot of you have, and there's a lot of information out there about what values are. Um, this is not by any means an exclusive list. These are just uh, some that I've put up, and I think you'll probably have a printout or something like that, but I'll um, I'll keep this up later on if you want in the exercise as well. But these are the kind of things we're looking at. But also, there doesn't have to be any of these. Um, what I want to notice now, if any of you have started looking down this list, your brain will already have started to do it. Um, and you'll start to see things like that will jump out at you, like, oh, love, balance, mastery. And you'll tick those off. And quite a lot of exercises to get you into your values are tick box exercises. But here's the problem with this. The problem with this is that what you're ticking is very probably, not always, but quite possibly aspired values. The values that you think you would like to have, but actually aren't really intrinsically authentic to you. Um, I always use the value, the example, I haven't put it here, but the, the value of self-discipline. If someone said to me, do you value self-discipline? I said, absolutely. You know, I get up in the morning and I do my yoga and meditation. I wouldn't get anywhere without self-discipline. But if somebody asked me the question, um, you could have your dream life, your dream life, but you would never have to operate um, uh, self-discipline. Would I take that life? You bet I would. But if someone said to me, you could have your dream life, but you could never be compassionate. I wouldn't want that life. I just couldn't. You know, you can never be compassionate. You can never be kind. You'd have to be a real martinet to people. Well, that's not a life that I want. So that means that there's something in there that's really important to me, an intrinsic value that is my GPS for how I operate in my life and for part of the way that I actually arrange my life personally and professionally as well. So. This is um, one of my heroes. Parker Palmer is the sort of uh, the founder of the Center um, for Courage and Compassion in um, 
uh, Central American states, Middle America, Middle America. And he says this, before you tell your life what you intend to do, to do with it, listen for what it intends to do with you. Before you tell your life what truths and values you've decided to live up to, let your life tell you what truths you embody, what values you represent. And the book is um, Let Your Life Speak, and I would really recommend that. Um, he's asking us to step away from the checklist. He's asking us to become interested in our own lives and mine that for the knowledge, for the values that we need in order to set consciously our GPS. And that's the point of really doing that today. It's what we're going to be doing in this. I'm going to give you a coaching exercise, um, uh, really to be able to start to set that GPS. So here is the exercise that I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to give you a visualization. Now, it's just to think of a memory, all right? Don't worry too much. There's no right or wrong. Maybe lots of things come up. Just pick one. Maybe nothing comes up. That's okay too. You can try this later on at home. Um, or just think, you know, I was doing this the other day on, on a workshop and someone said, well, I, I don't know. I'm just thinking about that. Is that right? You know, I'm on holiday. I'm like, great, fine. Wh whatever works. It's no problem at all. Um, then what I'm going to get us to do is I'm going to get us to do a little bit of writing around it. Now, what I would have done if we were all together is get us all in groups, get us all in couples. I would have trained you to be life coaches. But writing is actually really important. Um, writing, when you pick up a pen and you write, it actually slows things down in, time, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the neuroscience about it. You actually have much more of an integrated connection um, inside your brain as well. And by slowing things down, you get into what we call the narrative state. When you're in the narrative state, you know how a lot of you, I don't know if you, any of you into Bake Off, you know, if you know those, um, those milfoy, you know, those cakes that have many, many layers, those are kind of what our thoughts are like. But when we write down, when we get into narrative, when we write down the story that this happened and this happened and this happened, or this is how I feel, actually the act, the physical and cognitive act slows us down and gives us the opportunity to reflect and to look back on, um, on how we're feeling um, in a different way. It offers a different and more useful perspective. So this is what I'm going to invite you to do then. Take a moment now. The exercise is we're going to explore a memory. You're going to go into it with a series of questions that I'm going to ask you and I'm going to invite you to write down. And then at the end of it, I'm going to invite you just to kind of write down a few of the values that you think are coming, are coming out of this exercise that you can see, all right? But I'll lead you through that. So take a moment, get yourself comfortable. Now you might wanna close your eyes. There's absolutely no, um, no obligation to, that's not comfortable for you. Here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. Take a breath, first of all. Just observe that breath. I'm going to invite you to center a little bit. When you center, you switch your stress responses off or dial them down. So I'm going to invite you to loosen your belly. Now, depends if you've just eaten, how comfortable that is for you, but just release some of the tension around it. You might want to tense it and then release it a little bit. And now loosen your jaw, bring your tension up there. Perhaps push the tongue up to the roof of your mouth and release it. When you release your belly and you release your jaw, you're um, uh, releasing some of those um, uh, deeper muscles like the psoas that actually affect you and hold your stress. And then the final thing, loosen belly, loosen jaw, is just visualize that you're shining out in 360 degrees around you. So up, down, left, right, back, front. For some of you who are more visual, it might work to think about um, shining out like a light bulb. We might want to feel your heart is shining out. If this doesn't work for you, then you can try just accessing peripheral vision, putting your thumbs in front of you, and then moving your arms, extending them to a point at which you can still see your thumbs. 
And the reason that this works, just to dial down on your stress that's around, is because when we get stressed, we tend to, our, our ocular nerve, optic nerve kind of goes like this a little bit. Our brain focuses on what might be the source of threat. And when you do this, when you expand, you get into a peripheral vision, visual state, then the message gets sent up that we're not in a state of stress. So just a little bit of calming in there, centering. Belly, jaw, and shining out. And so what I'm going to invite you to do now is to think of a time when you felt really alive and try and make this specific. Now, notice that I said alive. It doesn't always mean that you're happy. We can feel alive in a crisis. You know, certainly in the first couple of weeks of the COVID crisis, a lot of people were stepping up and getting it together and taking leadership and getting organized and adapting, readjusting their lives. So it can also be at a time that we wouldn't necessarily call happy. So in this memory, start to get interested in the detail. What can you see? What can you hear? Is there anything that you can taste or smell? Where are you? Are you inside or outside? What can you feel against your skin? Are you with someone or alone or with lots of people? Just get curious about the detail. I'm going to invite you now, if you haven't already, just to take a couple of minutes to write down this memory. So you've got about two minutes to do this. It left. Just writing down what the memory was and anything else that you notice. But if you don't get to complete this at the moment, it's fine. You probably have enough already. So now I'm going to lead you through a series of reflective questions. And these are the kind of questions that typically, as a coach, I would ask someone when I do this exercise. And this is very much almost the first exercise that I do with people. So the first question for you to write, just think for a moment to write. What was important about this experience? or any of the elements of it. So what's important about this for you? By this, we start to go a bit deeper. So for instance, you know, if you were with people, what 
was important about the fact that you were with people? Is it um, connection, harmony, enlightenment, exchange? Starting to get a little bit deeper into what those values might be that this experience is showing you. Again, remember, this isn't an exam. It's not right. It's not wrong. You're just exploring. Another question that's very useful, how did you feel? Could be calm, serene, enlivened, so important because that gives you a huge amount of information. So how did you feel and what was important about that? What are the values that are nested inside how you feel when you're really alive. For me, when I feel very alive, I just feel this heart opening, you know, wholehearted. And that really is one of my core values, one of the things I live my life by, to be try and be wholehearted in everything I do. Is there anything else about this experience that's important? It's what I call shaking the tree. It's the most powerful coaching question. What else? Because quite often I find that people come up with their, um, um, if you like, the first draft. But there's always something else that's in the back that's just worth putting in there. And sometimes that's the real that's the real gem. So what else about this experience is important? It might be that you remember that somebody was there that you'd forgotten about. And there was something really important about that connection with them. So I'd like you to take a moment now, sit back. Some of you might be still writing and obviously this can, you know, this is also something that I would really recommend that you take some time out at the moment and sit down maybe for an hour and do this exercise as well. There's always more. But I want you to briefly read over, like let your eyes kind of dance over what you've written and notice words or ideas that get repeated. 
or words or ideas that make the most impact that jump out at you and just circle them or mark them or words or ideas that energize you in any of it, the memory, what was important about it to you, anything like that. Again, it's almost as if you're letting your unconscious do the work for you rather than scanning and um, like we're doing some kind of exam. You'll know when you've hit a value because it's kind of like hitting oil. You know, you get that kind of yes feeling to it rather than, or it really resonates and makes an impact with you rather than being kind of, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a bit like that. Would you like to change that word a little bit? Is it close but not quite there yet? What would be the word that if, if it was going to come out, you could hit it like you'd hit a bell and it would ring? This is a, a lovely exercise that comes out of a lot of the work that's been done on, on writing as therapy by people like Jim Pennebaker. So I will put that reference in in the break. So from that, I'd like you now, and this is just a draft, all right, to start to create a list of values, taking those words out and kind of putting them together. And it might be that you have a few. It might be that they're just a couple that really seem to resonate with you. Doesn't matter. There's no right and there's no wrong. Again, here are some of the suggestions, but please don't just look along and tick them off. Do, um, do uh, make sure that they're lined up with what you've already done in your peak experience exercise. And it would be really lovely if you feel happy to do this, if you perhaps like to share perhaps three of your core values in the chat box. The ability to help others in personal growth. It doesn't always have to be a word. Thank you, David. It can just be a line that gets it. Um, a dear friend of mine says that his values are all encompassed in the phrase like a gentleman. He's very, very clear on that. Openness, freedom, connection, acceptance. Thank you, Leela. Bravery, autonomy, love. Thank you, Olivia. Focused, hard work, confidence. Thanks, Sarah. Freedom, liberation, connectedness. Thanks, Amanda. These are great. I mean, there's no good or no bad. You can also have, you know, somebody once asked me, what about if you have a value of power and affluence? Fine. There's no good or bad. It is just your value. It, what, it's what motivates you intrinsically. So thank you for that. I'm going to give you an example because i got to get some skin in the game right about from my life. This is one of the things that I recommend that you do. Um, it's really useful. Like this is now your GPS. What you're going to want to do is align a lot of the choices that you make in your life with these values. Does it mean that you're going to have a happier life or an easier life? I could not guarantee you that, I promise you. But these are my core values and this is how I, I lead my life. So. They're all compound values, which you'll find as well as you kind of live consciously with your values. You might have had more already than just the three. My three values, are growth, love, and service. But you'll see that underneath that, and this makes sense for me. This isn't coming out of a book. It makes sense for me. These are the kind of values, the sub-values that are underneath this. But I just need to remember growth, love, and service. So whenever I need to make a decision, I, I use that as my GPS. Growth love 
and service. Am I in alignment all the way through with those three values? If yes, great. If not, if, if you know, not quite, like I could do something that's loving and in service, but without group, without growth, well, sometimes, yes, if I'm committing, uh, committing loving service to friends. But certainly in my professional life as a coach, these are my values. A different coach would have, might have different values. And I also want to say that these values don't make me a coach because it's not about the job description, right? I could have these values and be working in the military. I could be a baker. I could be a teacher. I could, um, I could be an artist. It, it, it really doesn't matter, okay? It's not the what. It's the why, if you like, and what's firing me out, firing you up from underneath those. So here's my, you know, as a coach, it's really important to get yourself into action because trust me, you can't think yourself into action. You kind of have to act and then the thought processes change again. It gets you into that new thinking habit as well. So first of all, work with your list of values to have a core list of three to five. It makes it nice and easy to remember. Honor them every day being and doing. What do I mean by that? Choose something. Like choose a value every day. Like somebody said, oh, connection. A lot of people have had connection. How are you honoring connection? Right. And connection can mean lots of things. It will mean different things to different people in different times. But how are you honoring connection? Are you connecting with people? Are you connecting with yourself? Are you connecting with nature? Um, when you're with people, are you truly present? Um, are you truly connecting? What's actually going on? How can you honor that? How can you make a choice, not just of what you do, but how you do it that starts to honor those connections? When you do that, you'll start to feel more energized. Things will start to open up a little bit more for you and you'll be starting to get your life off that automatically, that automatic and into conscious choice. And that's the final thing. Align your goals with them. Very often I've seen people set goals and they're kind of like, um, I uh, want my business turnover to double in the next year. Well, that's wonderful, but, but why? You know, if you start with that, that's your goal. Um, have you really aligned it with your values? Here's what I recommend you do. And it's a lovely thing to do now because there is going to be a new normal, as they're saying. Why not start with one of your values and then think how you might like to honor that in the next six months? How could you honor that value? What would be um, the way for you to do that? And then your goal comes out of that. Another thing to do, which I really recommend, and I will put the values thing up again at the end. Someone said I, I will put that up for you. Um, and you also have a printout of that too. When we have our to-do list, a lot of people have a list, literally just a list of things. I know my to-do list for some reason only ever has, it seems to permanently have 23 things on it. But this is a really good way to sort it out into what's important, what's not important. First of all, life and work. Keep these separate, all right? And there's good reason for that that I'll talk about. And then important and not important. And I've adapted this from the Eisenhower grid um, that some of you may be familiar with, but you might want to have a look at. So above the line is the stuff that's really important. It's the stuff that's moved the needle stuff. And of course, there's stuff that you have to do, right? Today, I had to be here at 3.15, ready for Niall to kind of switch me on to speak to you at, um, at the appointed time, which is what I, I love. But also, there's other stuff that I'm doing in my life, like writing my book, that is moving the needle, really important for me. The not important stuff is the kind of admin stuff that can kind of wait, um, it's all the kind of, oh, email this person, do that. You know, some of it will be important, but a lot of it won't. The reason that it's really important to do it like this is that you can have a look and you can see where you're spending your time. Because one of the things that our brain does is that something that's bigger and more important can sometimes seem a bit more uh, difficult and your brain might want to avoid it. Remember, it wants to have the easy route. So it will try and get its little dopamine fix um, by doing the kind of quick wins, the uh, instant gratification. Oh, look at me. I managed to return those pair of shoes that I ordered off the internet. Hurrah for me. Um, but that wasn't really important, right? That wasn't the important thing that you wanted to do today. So what was it? How was it enabling uh, you to live your honest, authentic life? Now, finally, I know we've been thinking a lot about purpose. 
And there's another way to think about how you might want to live your life. And I want to check because this can bring up quite a lot of emotions. Uh, Bronnie Ware is an Australian palliative nurse. And a few years ago, she wrote a blog, again, some of you might know it, called Five Regrets of the Dying. And she looked at, um, she asked people in the hospices in which she worked what they regretted. And these were the top five. And I want you to, uh, you know, this helps in a way because, as I always say to people, on your last day on earth, you will not wish that you cleared your inbox. And yet that's kind of how we spend our days as well, right? So here are the five regrets of the dying. Number one, and this was the most popular one, if that's the right term for a regret. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to me, not the life others expected of me. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And she said nearly all the men with whom she spoke said this, though I would imagine that a lot of women as well. Number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And number five, I wish I had let myself be happier. So notice what comes up for you when you look at this. Um, and again, this can bring up a few emotions. We're talking about regrets. But it also helps us to shift perspective a little bit because I'm not going to make any assumptions about your spiritual or religious beliefs. But let's make the assumption here, for me anyway, that this is the life that you've got. It's this one life. And that one day will be your last. Let that sink in for a moment. And again, just calibrate a little bit. Take care if it makes you feel a little bit emotional. But why that's important is as far as we know, we're the only sentient creatures who are aware of our own mortality. And that's why it actually gives our life meaning. And I know that you looked at, uh, you're talking about Nietzsche earlier today. Uh, he who has a why can deal with any how. But also I'd like you to consider the work of um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, which I'm sure quite a few of you will be familiar with, um, who talks about our need for meaning in our life. And meaning only comes knowing, perhaps, that our life is finite. So let this be a way for you to, to think about or consider or dream into what changes you would like to make in your life. I'd like you to now, just for the last couple of minutes, just to shift perspective to the end of your life. What's one regret you don't want to have? And what action could you take this week to make that a reality? Again, just jot down. If this is a difficult one for you, and, and sometimes it can be difficult, especially if you are currently grieving or if there's something else going on, please just sit back. Center a little bit, you don't have to do this. Loosen your belly, loosen your jaw. And this is just a piece of writing for yourself. You don't have to by any means, but if you would like to share, and sometimes it's quite useful to get that out. Um, is there something that you that, that that helps you to kind of shift that perspective? Live in the present. Thank you. to look after your health. I think that's come up for a lot of people in the current crisis, um, realizing the blessings of health is crucial. 
live for now, live in life with much less stress. So again, what this does is it helps us shift our perspective. You know, our lives, our, our cognitive um, space can get filled up with all of this kind of, um, all this malarkey, as I say, you know, all of the, um, the messages and the responses and all the rest of it. And self-reflection is so important. Self-reflection to go in, but also kind of to go out a little bit as well, to shift perspective so that we're not caught in the middle of this blizzard of ongoing um, short-term demands and gratifications. It's incredibly important. What's really important as a coach as well is that you don't sit with this kind of fearing this regret, that you think about the action that you could take because this is crucial. I would like you all now to take a moment to write down what your pledge for action is as a result of doing this just 55 minutes of reflection, um, I guess in the form, a little bit more of me talking, but having this little bit of reflection time, what's the one thing that you're gonna do and you're gonna put into action this week, this week. And you might want to set some accountability with somebody. Um, it's true that writing it down makes you more likely to do it. And telling people as well is much more likely to make you do it. Um, so yeah, keeping accountability partner is also useful. Um, I've gone really uh, uh, gangbusters in terms of um, uh, pushing on through a project when I have a quick call with somebody once a week to say, did you do your stuff? One, two, three, yes, you did, great. Did I do my stuff? One, two, three, yes, great. If that works for you, then do it. So again, take a moment to write that down. And if you'd like to, you're very welcome to share that in the chat box. Make a will, said Bernadette. Yes, I did that a few years ago and it felt great to do that. And you can download them from the web. Really, really useful. Test out your windsurfer. Ooh, thank you, Stephen. Put your phone down for longer. And also think about what's going to help you to do that as well, because don't forget your brain is a bit on automatic, right? What's going to help you? It might be that little centering technique that I just did then, because that takes the stress off and takes you a little bit of automatic, gives you a little bit more choice. Commit to mindful meditation. Appreciate people on calls, lovely. Let myself be sad in order to let myself be happy. Yeah, being able to tolerate uncomfortable feelings and emotions is absolutely crucial as part of growth. Reconnect with a friend. Don't lose this, hold on to this as well. It is so important. And the thing is, the moment that we finish this, we're gonna have questions in a little bit. But the minute we stop this, we can go off into like, oh, look, there's the sunshine and oh, look, there's Instagram and oh, look, like my kid and my dog and my hamster need attention. Don't lose this. Maybe put something in your diary. Make that list, that sort of, you know, the, the important, not important list. Make, do that straight away. You know, get into action. Whatever it is that's going to help you to do that, then do it, right? Change something in your environment. Remind yourself. Keep that list up somewhere. That will really help you. Don't put it in a notebook, fold it, and shove it away somewhere or in a drawer. Put it up somewhere. Put it on your screensaver. Having a structure that helps you to remind you will start to move you off that kind of unconscious automatic into conscious, choiceful, and authentic. We've got some questions here from some of the participants, so I'm just going to read them out and... Just let us know your response. Okay, so the first one is from Olivia and she's asked, what do you do about the fittings that come from knowing you might never have that peak experience again? Right. So one of the things that's really important for our growth is to develop our emotional literacy. And um, what you might want to do, first of all, is to start to identify what those feelings are. 
Um, partly we do that. Now, the important thing is to do this, right? We can easily jump to interpretation. But what I recommend that people do is just go into the body, right? The body is giving you lots of information all the time. So what does it feel like in your body when you think that you might never have that peak experience again? Maybe you notice, I don't know, a, a heaviness or a desire to swallow. Maybe there's a kind of a drop feeling in your stomach. Just notice what that is. And then give it a name as well. Um, it might be sadness, disappointment, loneliness. Um, get really um, granular about what those feelings are. So that would kind of be um, the first step, if you like, to develop that emotional literacy. And I recommend that people go on the web and look up something called the emotion wheel or the emotional literacy wheel, right? Um, because that will give you an idea of deepening. Because when we know exactly what we're feeling, then we can start to figure out what we might be able to do about it. So perhaps um, there's a sense of loneliness that comes up. Perhaps your peak experience was with someone that you're no longer with. Um, so sit with that, become aware of what it is, honor it as well, and then figure out, ask yourself this question, the most important question when you've got into, you've identified what your emotion is. Ask yourself, what do I need? And what can I give myself? Right? Um, one of the things that's really important is not to rely on external um, uh, stimuli, if you like, they're there. But what do you need to give to yourself in order to take care of yourself, feeling sad or lonely or disappointed or grief or whatever it is? That's incredibly important. So we shouldn't be... Um, we shouldn't be frightened if you're like, oh, I've just caught myself and should. Ah, um, Developing the ability to be tolerant of those uncomfortable feelings helps them to pass. Mm. It's when we don't acknowledge them, when we resist them, you know, with the saying, what resists persists, then we suffer. And the Buddhists put it really right. There are, they say that all pain is inevitable, right? But suffering isn't. So are we caught in what they call samsara, this constant wheel of, of beating ourselves up or disappointment or pain? And how can we get away from that? And sometimes one of the ways we can leave that point is by acknowledging our feelings so that they can be released again. And we, we don't just do this once, we do it again and again and again. 100%. That's a great answer, Fiona. Thank you. Um, the next one here is from Simone. And she's asked, what if your answers are different from what you thought your values were. Mm, interesting, right? That sometimes happens and it can be the difference. Sometimes you're holding on to values that you have learnt somewhere, all right? And there's nothing wrong with that. We learn what our values are. Like think about at the dinner table, right? With your family. We're learning about values all the time, about manners, you know, who gets to speak first and how to be polite and all of these things. But again, it can be that script that you've been following, right? Um, the authentic values are actually those that really light you up and motivate you from within. So I wouldn't worry about that. There's also, so the second thing is, I already sort of mentioned it, was that thing about aspired values. There could be things that we think are important to us, but actually they aren't. Another reason for that is that we're sometimes working with an out-of-date list because values can shift. Values can change. You know, when I was younger, um, I, I had some similar values. There's no doubt about it. But as I'm getting older, my values are shifting slightly, you know, um, or certainly the resonance around them is shifting. Um, when you uh, have, when you, when you become a parent, your values can shift a little bit as well. Um, so you shouldn't be too worried about that. Consider this an upgrade and an update. Great. Thanks very much, Fiona. Um, the next one here is from Ben. And Ben is interested to know what your take is on objectively good values. Do you believe or start to see healthy people converge on the same things? Um, the answer to that one is is um, is no, really. Um, because and I know I know where this is coming one. Some of that can be a should, right? There might be a should hidden in there. Uh, healthy people should all be about connection and love and generosity and helping others. And, and actually, you know, if that's not authentic, then it's not authentic. 
And I wouldn't dare work with someone and presume that um, that those are the things that are really going to light them up. Um, so don't judge yourself if you've got values that aren't about that. You know, a lot of the great clients that I have have values of I'm going to look down that list of um, of mastery, of candor, you know, of honesty, um, of raising the bar and excellence, you know, of grit and determination. Those are really important values as well. Um, so there aren't sort of there aren't better or worse values. A value is just a value is just a value. Where it's the question we need to ask is not whether it's good or bad, but is it helpful to us? Helps us get a bit further down the road or unhelpful and really scrutinizing whether it's coming externally or internally as well. It took, a lot of sense. took me a long time. Anecdotally, it took me a little while to get to love as a connection because I was kind of like, oh, that's so icky and hippie and well, I can't go anywhere near that. Um, but actually, I realized I have so many values around kindness and compassion and connection um, that I eventually went, oh, God, I just have to call it love. And something and something shifted then, right? Um, uh, I realized that actually, I mean, a lot of the work that I do, if I'm, you know, I'm kind of, and I'll let you all in on a secret, I'm kind of a secret stealth soul worker, right? Um, but I'd never call myself that. But that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm helping people connect with their hearts and with their souls. But a lot of the clients with whom I work, I couldn't use that word. I could, you know, people would, people would freak out. What I mean by heart is connecting to what you care about, what you long for, what's authentic to you. And when I talk about connecting to soul, I'm talking about what the big picture is. The question that we looked at at the end, you know, shifting perspective to the end of your life is a soul question, if you like. So you're not just thinking about the here and now, you're thinking about the big picture. That's what I mean by soul as well. So a lot of my clients, um, they lead corporations, they're politicians, they're they're, they're not people who would use that language at all. But that doesn't mean that what they're operating from isn't very, very much about that kind of um, what do I care about and what matters and what's important and, and how, do, how do I change, um, how, do I, how does that connect to the big picture of my life or those that I influence in the small realm and in the large realm as well. 100%. Um, so our next question here is from Michelle. And Michelle's asked, how do you connect with feelings and emotions if you've become quite numb or detached? Have you got any advice there? Yeah, I can really, I can really relate to that. I really can. Um, I mentioned about the emotional literacy before. Um, there's a couple of ways into this, um, Michelle, and I'm not going to make any assumptions here, but I know that a couple of people, when we were doing this, were talking about trauma. So I'm not necessarily talking about you. I'm offering certain ways in. If you feel that there is trauma that is as a protection for yourself that you have numbed and disassociated, then I really recognize, rec recognize that um, most of us are traumatized. I have trauma in my life as well. Um, and uh, do the unnumbing in a very gentle way and do it with supervision or support um, of a professional. And one of the people that I would rec recommend is Peter Levine's work on trauma and the body. And you work very gently through the body in kind of resensitizing yourself again. And that's really important because it's the body that holds trauma and so the body that can go into shutdown as well. So that's one way to think about it if you're suggesting that there might be a trauma pattern. Sometimes what we feel is numbness and detachment might be because we're affected by something else. So it might be that we are not living a life authentic to us. We haven't felt alive for a while. Um, so I would really ask you to actually um, connect with those things that do help um, revivify you, if you like. And also uh, the, the third thing would be looking at that emotional literacy wheel. Sometimes what we feel is numbness and dissociation is actually speeding up. We actually want to speed up because we don't want to feel so I would recommend that you can either do therapeutic work or, or sometimes there's some good meditation. And I would recommend um, uh, Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, her work on self-compassion that just allows you to slow down with your emotions a little bit to allow yourself to feel. Certainly, there are lots of things around us that can separate us, distract us 
from our feelings. And sometimes it's because they're uncomfortable, right? Um, there is a process called RAIN, R-A-I-N, which will help you to connect with what you're feeling again once you're allowing yourself to slow down. And the R is for recognizing what you're feeling. The A is for acknowledging. The I is for inquiring. And the N is for nurturing. And I'm very happy. Ah, oh, Tara Brax, someone always knows it, Simone. It's really, really great work. And I would really recommend that. So I'm just going to, while you read the next one out, oh, and there's a Peter Levine workshop. Great. I'm just going to put those, a couple of those um, uh, references while you tell me the next question. Awesome. We're going to link to these in a document with all the references from today as well. So Brilliant. that's, we'll, put, we'll link that in the chat and you get an email with it after as well. Um, so the next question, this is a really interesting one from Roshin. She's asked, how do we make sure the goals we aim to complete uh, in, that are in line with our values are achievable and realistic? Great, great question. So the way that you do this is you think about a goal and you're kind of down to the smart bit as well. So first of all, you need to make it specific. So when I work, I start with a value, like let's say creativity. And I think, well, what's the goal that will help me to honor that value this year? And I might, I, so what I do is I start getting specific. So I might say, right, I'm going to write six workshops or a new workshop on self-compassion or the inner critic or self-direction or leadership. The book that I'm writing is on, on self-leadership and leadership. Um, and I get very specific with what it is, make it specific, um, make it measurable, so I'm going to write six workshops, not uh, I'm going to write a book. So not like, oh, I'm going to do some writing, but make it really specific. Um, make it achievable. So give yourself a time frame. Like, can I do this by the end of the year? Okay. Yeah, I think I can. And that's the final thing. Make it timely as well. So make sure that you've got, you've got it on a time limit. And that really kind of gives you that boundedness about it as well. And you can read a lot about SMART goals online. They're really, really useful. Um, and that's my check. So I always make it time banded, always make it specific, always uh, enumerate it um, and make it achievable by noticing if, you know, don't make it, don't make it too easy is what I always say, but I would say that I'm a coach, right? Make it so it's just on that edge of yeah, that feels challenging enough, but I could do it. So, for instance, if I said to myself, okay, I want to write a book in the next month. Now, I know a couple of people who could do that. I know that I can't. What I don't want to do is create something that's like a goal that's like I take it, I sharpen it into a stick, and then I stab myself with it, right? Um, you know, oh, look at me. I'm terrible. I didn't manage to do it. Um, that's why the smart thing is really useful. But also don't forget that something might happen, right? So you might have had goals that you wanted to have this year. And then COVID hits, and maybe you can't do the things that you were planning to for lots of reasons. Again, let that go and recalibrate around that as well. But it's a question of calibration and clarity. Really, really important. Mm, very interesting. Um, this is actually my own question. So you mentioned some really good questions that people can use um, during your talk. Um, I'm curious, do you have any questions that you ask yourself regularly to sort of um, to increase your sense of clarity? And yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you have any questions you continue to ask yourself? Yeah, I, I like that one. Thank you. So here's one that helps me. All right. And, and I would, you know, if you want to do write these ones down, if you're listening. Um, so if I think of doing something, and I say, oh, okay, right, I could uh, write a workshop or a talk. I ask myself the question, so if what I'm proposing is a four, what would a nine be? Because there are ways that we, you know, we keep ourselves small. Our inner critics try and keep us in our comfort zone a little bit too much, you know, to, in order to try and keep us safe. There are very good reasons for doing that, and I do lots of work on inner critics. I've also got if people experience imposter syndrome, which is also another way to keep us small. There's an article I wrote in The Guardian and you can Google that and, and look at it. So that's a good way to get yourself out of keeping yourself safe and small. Um, the other question I ask is this, especially at a time of difficulty. Um, if, this, if, I'm, if this is a chapter in my life's journey, what's the title of this chapter? It's really good. I know. <laughs> I just find it so useful, right? Because we can get stuck in it and we don't see ourselves as being on, if you like, the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell said, which is really understanding that, 
you know, I was just writing a, a piece in the book last night and about resilience. And I said, you know what? Life isn't easy and it isn't fair. Um, and we might want a magic pill that would make it easy. But then I realized about myself that if I hadn't had to overcome difficulties, then I wouldn't even know how to do that. I wouldn't even know that I could, right? So what is the title of the chapter? And it might be reflection. It might be release. It might be um, the watch and the tree, as I wrote something last night. You know, um, whatever it is to make sense of you, to understand that your story continues. Your mm. story continues and you are writing it. There's a, a writer that I love very much called Richard Rohr, um, R-O-H-R, who wrote this book called Falling Upwards, which is about the second half of life, which I'm very interested in being 51 years old, right? Um, and also being at point when my parents are quite elderly. And he basically said, you know, the first part of life is discovering your own authentic script. The second half of life is writing it, is writing your own script. And I love that. Thank you. Yes, Simone, I love him too. I'll put that reference in there. Keep going. These are great questions. Hope they're helpful. That's really interesting, Hula. Thank you. Um, okay, next one is from Amy Aaron. And Amy has asked, how do we focus on living in line with our values without becoming fixated on making sure everything we do fits with them, thereby not allowing ourselves to just be? Right. Very good question. So I would go back to Parker Palmer again, right? Um, don't try and force um, when you get into the habit, and it takes about two to three months of, of habit, of conscious habit, of conscious choice becoming habit, then you will feel more in a flow. It will become, if you like, your usual automatic. So I used to sweat about saying no to things. I don't do that anymore because I trust myself. I don't have to analyze whether this is um, growth, service, and love that's not being honored here. I just trust that I've got, I, I, my intuition has taken me into the right place because my intuition is actually those conscious experiences or beliefs or things that I've really examined that have become then, um, become uh, 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 enfolded in me as well. Um, we shouldn't use these to put pressure on ourselves, right? There's a, um, a, a lovely idea about life, which is called that Wu Wei idea about go about being in the flow of life which is really important at the same time as making sure that the flow of life that we're in is kind of where we want to be as well right um, but returning to the present is really important and I know that a few of you have meditation practice and I would say that that's really useful I meditate every day because there's no point I, there, there's no point that you get to a, a great enlightenment right you just have to practice every day. You have to integrate those practices in being able to be in the present and allow life to unfold at the same time as making sure, like the way that I think about it is that you're, you're kind of, think of your life as a boat, right? And you're the captain of the boat and you've got your hands on the wheel. Now, you've got to check that the boat is okay, right? And checking that your values is really important because every boat needs a GPS, Right. What might happen in life is that you might have to change direction. You might get storms. You might get all kinds of pirates, who knows, right? But as long as you've got your hands on the wheel, you know that you can steer this wherever you need to go in, in a responsiveness. And that's really important, a responsive rather than a reactive flow. So I hope that's helpful. Definitely. Um, so we've got another question here from Caroline. And Caroline has asked, how can I positively and effectively share my values with my colleagues to benefit our working together more insightfully of each other's values? This is a great question, Caroline. Thank you. So there is an exercise that I would really recommend if you're interested called designing an alliance. And that's where a group of people come together to share the values of how they want to be and work together. When we work and we live together, it's very easy for things to become transactional and instrumental. So have you finished that project? Have What's the deadline? what's our budget, all of those kind of questions, rather than thinking about how we want to work together and what are the values by which we want to work together. So this is kind of what you do. You can do this exercise, have a big piece of paper so that you all agree what you put down. What you're doing is you're creating a contract. There are certain questions that you can ask. So what does this um, uh, 
what did this group of people, what do we need in order for our relationship, for our collaboration to thrive? And ask for the values, but very important, the values in action. So if someone says, we need empathy, great. What does that look like in action? Oh, it means that when someone's speaking, they don't get cut off by somebody else, right? Or if someone says, look, I'm really struggling with this, rather than being criticized, people understand what's going on, right? So those are the things you do. And then you agree. Does everyone want empathy? Does everyone agree that we'll not cut people off and understand and listen? Great. And then you write that on a piece of paper. And then you go forward like that. And there might be other things in there. You would also ask the question, okay, so this is what we need to thrive. But what about when things go wrong? What about when things get difficult? What are the values and what are the behaviors by which we want to operate together that will really help us? And how will we know we got that? So that's a really important exercise. And it's a lovely way for people to share values because values, shared values, or what really supercharges a team and makes it a high-performing team as well in whatever, whether it's community, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's um, workplace, of course. This is incredibly important. So I think it's a terrific question to ask. 100%. Um, it seems that so much of our behavior is dictated by our, our values, you know, almost on, a, on an unconscious level. And what would you say to someone who feels that their value hierarchy might be a bit it might be getting them results in their life that they they don't want. And yeah, it's getting them getting results that they don't want. Like how can someone reorganize that that structure? Is that is that possible to do? And and if so, how? You can. I mean, what I would say is is it you know, spend some reflection time. You know, is it the aspired values or the script that's in there rather than the authentic values? But as I said at the beginning, you know, there's no guarantee that you're gonna live a, a happier, wiser life. Uh, sorry, a happier or easier life by living your values, because there are still things that you need to do. So, for instance, I have a value of love, but I still need to hold boundaries. I still need to say no to people. And one of the things that I struggle with, so if you like, every value can have another side to it. I'm very loving and giving and generous, but sometimes I'm exhausted because of that. Sometimes I can even feel resentful, right? Because I feel like, well, wait a minute, I'm giving all this love, but it's not really coming back at me. So I need to watch then if there are particular saboteurs that are kind of um, uh, causing me difficulty with that as well. So that's really important. Growth is really important. But you know what? Sometimes I have to put down the book, put down the learning and just be in the moment. Right. And service is incredibly important to me. But sometimes I can just do something for the sake of it um, and have pleasure around that. Or also make sure that, um, that again, I'm not exhausting myself or that I'm not um, uh, chasing something, um, you know, uh, to fill what the Buddhists call the hungry ghost, right? Um, it's what I call the Twinkies diet. So sometimes you can just be eating and eating and eating and eating, but you're not getting your nourishment. So what is it that really nourishes me? I can grow. I mean, I, for years I did a, a PhD at, at New York University which was wonderful for learning and growth, amazing. But I realized that I was able to understand the most complex philosophical theory, but I didn't really understand what was going on in my heart. So that's when I needed to kind of shift from just the head learning into the heart learning. So it might be that that could be going on as well. So those are some recommendations that I would give. That's awesome, Fiona. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's all we've got time for today, but that was a really powerful presentation and I just, it was amazing. So, so thank you. And have you got any final things you'd like to share with people? Any like um, your website, where, where would you like people to go after this talk? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I mean, we can never do enough. I mean, we could sit here all afternoon and I would love to answer everyone's questions. They've been brilliant questions. So if you go to my website, uh, fionabucklandcoaching.com, I have a resources section. And underneath there, there are reading lists, there are videos, there are podcasts, there are exercises. There's all kinds of resources that you can use that I give away freely as well. So I would really recommend that people go and have a look at that. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank and you. You too as well. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much for asking me. And thank you, everybody. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.